On January 3rd, 1980, Eula Roberts drove back from Georgia where she was visiting relatives to the small community of Mars Hill. Driving up to the farmstead, she noticed the door was open and walking inside, she found the bodies of her brother, Lum, 79, and her sisters, Maybell and Floyd, age 77 and 64. Eula Roberts frantically began searching for her brother Mac and ran to the back room looking for him. There she saw him struggling to stay alive with five bullets in his body. He lived for several days but was deep in a coma and unable to give any information on the brutal massacre. Sheriff Jack Norton arrived very quickly to the scene of the massacre, and by the following morning, the area was being combed by the Alabama Bureau of Investigations, the GBI, the Cleburne County Sheriff's Department, and representatives of Georgia's Polk County Sheriff's Office. The only thing stolen by the killers was a chest locally rumored to contain about $40,000, but in reality only holding about 1500 The killers left checkbooks and purses containing $800 in the home. Sheriff Norton noted that the guns used included a sawed-off shotgun and a 38 revolver. He told the papers that the murderers walked right in and that it was very likely the Roberts family knew their killers because no sign of a struggle was found. In fact, Maybell still had the sewing thimble in her hand. Both men were bedridden with cancer and couldn't even defend themselves. Officially, the Mars Hill murderers were never apprehended, but in the years to follow, a number of killings would take place which were oddly tied to the murders. It seemed to be that some people were tying off loose ends. Carlton DeMoss began expressing anxiety and regret about something to his wife. All of his statements were kept very vague, but he told her on several occasions that he'd done something horrible and couldn't live with it. When Carlton was only 24 years old, he took his own life with a pistol. DeMoss lived down the road a few hundred yards from the Roberts family, and locals started connecting the dots. Nearly three years after the murders of the Roberts family, the money trunk was found only three miles away in the forests surrounding the small town of Fruithurst by a couple of hunters. The sheriff started talking, not to the papers, but to some of his friends, and news spread as it does in small towns. He said he felt the only people who had intimate knowledge of the Mars Hill murders were Carlton DeMoss and a man named Roy Harris, and as the rumors began to swirl, another mysterious murder was committed in the county, and Roy Harris began to tell anyone who would listen that bad men were out to kill him. He refused to say who, fearful he'd be roped into their crimes, but everyone knew Roy Harris's days were numbered. Before we discuss the brutal slaying of Roy Harris, it's important to understand the Roberts farm and their neighbors. For decades, they lived in their ancient house next to Deacon John Hamrick. They were in a very remote part of the county, far removed from any major road that would lead to or from Anniston or East Gadsden. Their closest neighbor was a man of God. In short, there was no real reason to drive down the road to the Hamrick or Roberts families for any nefarious purpose. This living arrangement changed in the 1960s when John Hamrick retired and sold the farm to Virginia Lee and her family. She sold a few acres to Virgil DeMoss, who lived with his son, Carlton. These families opened up a cockfighting business, which the Roberts family didn't really appreciate. Still, they stayed cordial and didn't go to the police, but every other Sunday they could expect cars to line up from one barn to the other the entire length of the gravel road. Now, if we were to connect the dots so far, it would seem as though the farm adjacent to the Roberts family passed from a deacon to two new families that opened up a cockfighting ring. One of these was the DeMoss family, whose son had said he'd done something terrible and then killed himself. Newspapers announced a chilling discovery, the burned body of an unidentified black man burned alive on a dirt road only a hundred or so yards away from the Sheriff Norton, who lived in an isolated trailer here in Cleburne County. The black man wore what newspapers described as sex toy handcuffs and was dressed exceptionally well. He had on cowboy boots and a nice leather jacket. He was tortured, doused in gas, and set alight. As far as I know, this man to this day has never been identified, but from this point forward, Roy Harris seemed frantic. Loose ends seemed to be getting tied off, and he considered himself one of those loose ends. Harris was just a poor mechanic here in Fruithurst, only a stone's throw away from the small community of Mars Hill. And on December 29th, police fished his body out of the Tallapoosa River. Oddly, his head had been shaved bald, and he seems to have been tortured pretty severely before being executed with a few shots to the back of the head. To understand who would kill him and why they would torture him, we have to look at the entirety of the Harris family, which seems to be a connection to the old school Dixie Mafia, a family that had a bit of institutional power right here in eastern Alabama. Roy's father, Hoyt Harris, affectionately known as Junior, was well-liked on the state line. Newspaper articles show that Junior Harris was the mayor in 1956 until at least 1963, but in 1967 he was arrested for operating a still. 
This bust also took in one of Junior Harris's friends from the same town and two men from nearby Oak Level. One of them, Preston Ray Gilmore, was killed three years later when he was 21. In a high-speed chase, he made a wrong turn and wrapped his car around a telephone pole near Tallapoosa. Clearly, the Harris family had connections to their patriarch, the town's mayor, who was also engaged in some pretty serious bootlegging across the state line. Just this one clipping shows that they had hundreds of gallons per still and were selling it at $10 a gallon. Death seemed to stalk the Harris family, and several relatives of the mayor, Hoyt Jr., died mysteriously. In 1958, his brother, Webster, died of a brief illness at a veterans hospital in Atlanta. I won't conjecture about the nature of the illness, but he did work as a truck driver here in Fruithurst, and he was a hardened World War II veteran. Another one of the mayor's brothers, Kenneth, also a World War II veteran, died in a mysterious house fire in 1968. Papers quickly reported that three men had been arrested in the burning of his trailer, and that he may have actually been murdered before the fire was even lit. Still another World War II veteran brother of the mayor was Kirby. He, like Webster, died of a sudden illness at the Veterans Hospital. These three brothers all passed before Hoyt Jr. and must have deeply affected him. Violence surrounded the family, and after losing his sister and another World War II veteran brother, the killing of his son Roy must have absolutely crushed Hoyt Jr. About two years after Roy Harris and DeMoss were both dead, a deputy U.S. marshal in Cleburne County by the name of Old Bear Hyatt was at a family reunion. That's when he saw his own brother, Charles, playing with a sawed-off shotgun, and he confiscated it, placing it in evidence all very hush-hush. At the time, no doubt, he just figured that his brother was playing around with an illegally modified shotgun, not realizing the seriousness of actually modifying a shotgun in that way. It wasn't until there was a small forest fire in the Talladega National Forest that he started connecting the dots. Right after that small forest fire, police arrested a local man named Jerry Hyatt, the son of the town councilman and police officer Lawrence Hyatt. And about that time, at least according to local rumors I've read online, the deputy U.S. Marshal Old Bear received a call from his brother, from whom he'd confiscated that shotgun, asking him if he could be so kind as to lose it. During the Mars Hill murders, they used a sawed-off shotgun and a 38 revolver. Now, at that point, the deputy marshal realized that they were trying to cover something up, and seeing how this could be construed as a conspiracy, he bumped all of that information up to his superiors. Two indictments were eventually passed down, and the weapons had been positively tied to the Mars Hill murders. By the time Charles Hyatt had been sentenced, it was for weapon modification, but oddly the shotgun in evidence was a new one, one not associated with the Roberts family massacre. The court also charged him with altering the second shotgun to make it appear it was used in the slayings and providing criminal assistance to Bill and Jerry Hyatt, the two men buried here. That's Bill, and that's Jerry. As a result of the trial, Jerry Hyatt and his friend Anthony Bell were given life sentences and indicted for perjury, but it seems like Jerry was soon let out. I can't find records for this, so again, if I'm missing any details here, please correct me in the comments. It is worth noting that Jerry was the son of Lawrence Hyatt, a decorated World War II veteran and a very influential man in the town of Fruithurst. I just want you to imagine the dynamics of the Hyatt family in this small town in eastern Alabama. After all, their father, Lawrence, was a World War II veteran, very well respected as a police officer and as a councilman alongside his son, Jerry Hyatt, who was also an army veteran. Now, Jerry Hyatt had a number of arrests with Bill Hyatt, who's buried right behind him, but these were for nothing serious. It was always for criminal mischief or some small fights, nothing that serious as far as I can tell. And Bill Hyatt was the son of Charles Hyatt, who is incredibly closely wrapped up in the Mars Hill case. And keep in mind that Jerry Hyatt and Bill Hyatt, buried over here, were both nephews of the deputy U.S. Marshal here in Cleburne County, a man named Old Bear Hyatt, who blew the lid off of the Mars Hill weapons case. Charles Hyatt only died very recently, but his son Bill was killed mysteriously in 1996, executed with three or four shots from a revolver after taking a serious beating, put into the back of a pickup truck, and abandoned close to the Georgia-Alabama state line. This all happened in 1996, years after the Mars Hill murders. And by the way, it was mentioned at the trial that Charles Hyatt, buried on the left, was the one who the gun was confiscated from, but it was his son Bill, here on the right, that actually owned the shotgun.
So finally we've come to the question, what exactly happened at the Mars Hill murders? Who was responsible? And why were so many lives claimed in the years and decades to follow? A local posted about 10 years ago on Reddit that the lore in eastern Alabama goes something like this. The Roberts had been living next to the Deacon for most of their lives until he sold the property to the Lees. The Lee family then invited the DeMoss family, and the two opened their property up for cockfights. In spite of strained relations, they were cordial, and at one point one of the Roberts probably told Carlton DeMoss they kept $40,000 in a safe because they didn't trust the banks. It's unknown when they said this, but the DeMoss family had been there for a few years before the murders. At some point, two of the Roberts brothers got cancer and were bedridden, and by then Carlton DeMoss had met Roy Harris at their weekly cockfights, a man with family connections. His father was the mayor of a nearby town, and most of his relatives were veterans. They were also wrapped up in bootlegging, but kept things fairly white collar. So Carlton DeMoss probably suggested to Roy Harris that they use their dad's influence to rob the Roberts family. It would be a quick job made especially easy by how old they were and how half the home couldn't get out of bed. Many members of the Harris family probably overheard the plan and caught snippets of it. Again, just an easy robbery. The $40,000 was too enticing, but Roy wasn't much of a criminal, so he found some actual local Tufts and Fruithurst, the Hyatt family, about as gritty as you can get. Perhaps they brought with them a still unidentified black man that was burned in the country roads surrounding town to extract information from him, but maybe this was unrelated to the case entirely. In any case, on January 3, 1980, they arrived to the Roberts' farm and began searching for the chest. At some point, one of the robbers discovered they'd risked it all for a meager $1,500 and shot one of the Roberts. The accomplices then realized they'd all be accessory to murder if found out, so they executed everybody in the house. After the robbery, their small sum was divided. They agreed to keep silent, which the Hyatts were very good at. Carlton DeMoss, however, was not. He was just a normal guy who lived next to the unfortunate elderly family, and when the chest was found in the woods three years later, he felt guilty and ended his own life. Feeling that the walls were closing in, again according to local rumor, Roy Harris was tortured. He wanted to know what he'd told his dad and were especially pissed at the fact that he'd been telling everybody that bad people were coming to kill him. Roy Harris couldn't keep quiet and sadly, he paid the ultimate price for it. Up until the mid-2000s, members of the Harris family were being killed to cover up the nephews of Marshall Olbert, who revealed that his own kin were in the possession of the murder weapons. Roy Harris's own son was killed in 1998 by someone who was scared he could implicate them. Then, his brother was killed in a surprise attack more than a decade later, in 2009. Charles Hyatt, whose shotgun was first seized by his own brother in 1986, passed away on Christmas, 2020. He was 84 years old.